Good morning, everyone. I appreciate you, uh, you all coming in. Uh, I thought the bell ringing to bring everyone in for this uh, particular session was very uh, professionally done. Um, so, um, yeah, it's good to see you all. This, as, this is the panel that I assume that everyone came for, right? I mean, I understand there's other fields of interest out there, but building the fleets of tomorrow is kind of what is the exciting thing that focuses and unifies us, I think, as a group. And for those that don't feel differently, um, I won't be offended if you get up and leave at some point. Um, so we have a very distinguished panel here, and we, we actually have a, an additional member who is, uh, will be joining us online. The way it's going to play out, I won't read the bios because they are all uh, available uh, online. Uh, if you go speakers, drop down the bios, they're all available. But I will highlight that we have what I believe to be possibly the newest PhD from the University of Calgary um, ever, uh, Dr. Tim Choi. Uh, so some of your, your things there may say, Mr. So can I get a round of applause? Because I think a PhD is a pretty big deal. <laughs> Anytime. So with that, um, as much as I'm sure you would love to listen to me, I will uh, yield the floor and uh, Dr. Choi. Thanks very much, Anne and thank you, everyone. Um, can I have my slides, up, please? Thank you. So, you know, most of this uh, conference has so far really been on sea power outputs, right? What is it we do with our fleets? What is it that navies do, coast guards? <laughs> Um, the general geopolitical context in which everything's involved. And of course, our last um, panel really started off the discussion with, you know, the sea power inputs, you know, what it is that we have and how do we, you know, what are the future prospects of that? And of course, this panel, we're much more on the sort of more conventional take on uh, those sea power inputs. And, you know, my contribution today, you know, I was, I'm here standing in for Dr. Dave Perry, which for those of you in the Canadian uh, naval space would be very familiar with as someone who's, you know, doing naval procurement and defense procurement and like the top voice for that. So I'm a sort of a pale imitation of that and I'll do my best uh, from my own perspective here. Um, so starting off with the front slide here, we have of course one of the um, Coast Guard, Canadian Coast Guard Offshore Fishery Science Festival that I took back in 2018. And it was one of three vessels and the first completed class of vessels under what Canada calls the National Shipbuilding Strategy. And the National Shipbuilding Strategy is a single overarching umbrella program that, category, that includes all the ships all the major vessels, all the smaller vessels, and then the repair, refit, and conversion work uh, for the federal government of Canada. And so we're gonna talk a bit more about what are the details of that today, uh, some of the major questions that are, have, have arisen or should have arose many years ago. Um, and you know, I know a lot of you are Canadians, so you're already familiar with the general contours of the strategy, uh, but I also know a lot of you are from you know, other countries as well. So this is gonna be mostly more of a descriptive presentation than it is one that's um, more on the analytical side. Uh -huh, introduction, here it is. Um, so here in the, the picture in the background is uh, Irving Shipbuilding in Halifax, co-located sort of adjacent to our Halifax um, naval base there. And you see in the, the ship in the front there is uh, HMCS Harry the Wolf, the first of our Arctic offshore patrol vessels. Um, you know, we're building six of those for the Navy, plus two more for the Coast Guard, and we'll get into that a little bit more. Um, so, but to zoom out back a little bit, you know, the National Shipbuilding Strategy, why did we have one? Like, what is the overall purpose of it? Um, I mean, obviously there's the major priority of actually replacing the ships that we currently have and perhaps expanding their capabilities to some extent. Uh, but it was also about managing the boom and bust cycle that has uh, characterized Canadian shipbuilding for a long time. And of course, I think uh, Cormando Levy uh, mentioned that was also the case for the Australian uh, situation. And so there are a lot of similarities there. And you know, a lot of the emphasis on ending that boom and bust was for ending the boom and bust for industry. But I would argue that the more important thing, at least in the long, long term, is managing the boom and bust for um, the bureaucracy and Canadian institutions in government to make sure that we don't lose all the capability that's been built in to support the acquisition of ships and saying our requirements and all the little back work things uh, that are required to actually put steel hulls in water. Um, and so this general uh, 
proceedings we're going to go through is uh, going to talk about the yards and the builds that are currently on the list and then a little bit more about the Coast Guard vessel and then I'll probably spend most of the time on the uh, RCN, the Navy vessels, because you know most of you here are Navy, um, and some critical questions involved. So major shipyards are being built. Uh, apologize for a small-ish font. Red is for the Canadian Coast Guard. The light blue are for uh, the Navy. No whalers. Um, so you can see there's a very large number of ships that are being listed, right? Um, you know, but unfortunately, a lot of them are also kind of one-offs. And the problem with one-offs is that they're incredibly expensive because you can't amortize the costs over the entire run. Um, and you see that some of these shipyards are a little bit um, more uh, vulnerable to that kind of situation than others. Uh, so C-SPAN in Vancouver, I mentioned initially that they built you know, the three offshore fishery science vessels, so that's great, they have a run of three, so they have a bit of um, you know, course amortization there, uh, but they're also slated to build a heavy icebreaker, the heavy polar icebreaker, and you know, that's just a one-off. And then they're also gonna build the offshore oceanographic science vessel, also a one-off, and then it's not, and then the two joint support ships, and those are very large uh, vessels as well. So those are more or less all in various stages of construction. The uh, heavy icebreaker is still in design stage. Um, and af only after these uh, fairly complex single one-off vessels are done can they actually get into a steady state of uh, consistent continual construction with the MPVs or multi-purpose vessels. And these are for the Canadian Coast Guard's uh, boy tending, a lot of safety or navigation type things, um, and serve as light icebreakers on the Great Lakes as well. So, you know, and that's not gonna start happening until 2030 or so. Um, under Irving and Halifax, they're responsible for the combat ship package. So they're building, of course, the Arctic offshore patrol vessels. Again, three remaining for the Navy and two for the Coast Guard. Ironically, the Coast Guard ones are actually a little bit more technologically demanding than the uh, Navy ones because they have to insert a lot of uh, um, hull water probes and sonars and echo sounders and cranes and all sorts of other things. Um, so there are a lot more design work involved with just converting the Navy version into the Coast Guard version than most people expect. So whenever you see a, you know, sort of news articles about why are we, why does it cost so much to build a demilitarized version of an AOPS? Well, it's because there is actually more stuff in it. Um, there's that. And of course, the uh, crown jewel of everything is the 15 Canadian, Canadian service combatants, the CSCs. You know, Frigates, destroyers, call them whatever it is these days. Um, you know, the line between two are incredibly blurry. Nobody really cares. Um, you know, it's just a, this is a replacement for our frigates and destroyers, and that's what they are um, on more or less a one for one basis. So, you know, pretty good that. Uh, and finally, Davy Shipyards, they're finalizing their um, entry into the National Shipping Strategy. Um, you know, they're slated to build one icebreaker, one heavy icebreaker as well, so we'll finally have two. And that's a fairly late addition by the Trudeau government back in 2019. And they will also be building six medium icebreakers that will serve, you know, during summertime in the Arctic as well. So a fairly large number of vessels, and that gives you a general uh, overview of where they are. Um, so the Coast Guard, you know, the heavy icebreaker, um, you see, you've heard about how the Americans are having problems with that. Well, I mean, we're just slightly, you know, not much better off. <laughs> um, you know, we were supposed to have started building this thing many, many years ago, but uh, it has always been pushed back. And a lot of that was due to the competing priorities between the icebreaker and the joint support ships for the Navy, which are, you know, sort of a refueler uh, type of FESO. And both of those things are unfortunately equally old, and uh, the Navy's one were for cell service earlier, so um, really prioritize the um, joint support ships instead of building the icebreakers. Um, so that's a problem with having, you know, shipyards that can only build one ship at a time. Um, that's the way it be. Um, so, you know, I, that, I mentioned already that AV was added as the uh, third shipyard and is focusing solely on the icebreakers uh, to date. Um, you know, the problem with, of course, splitting the uh, ships between two yards is that you don't benefit from uh, economies of scale, right? You don't, the learning from one yard doesn't apply to the other because they use different processes and all that stuff, and production engineering, you have to do separate ones for both of them, so now it costs more. But the benefit of this is that you're saved from the political machinations um, of politicians. And because now Quebec being a major, of course, uh, vote uh, sector, sector um, you know, they're now having, now they're happy. And so, you know, it's very unlikely that any party coming into the future, whether conservative or liberal or, you know, NDP, um, you know, they're not gonna cancel it because now both yards, you know, are happy with this kind of thing. And they're not gonna see that kind of, a, we're just gonna cancel it from this yard and shift it to this yard for, you know, whatever reason. 
here. So, you know, so it's a guaranteed arrival of ships versus cost savings. It's, a two, it's always a consistent theme here in Canada, I think for a lot of countries as well. OPVs, uh, offshore patrol vessels for the uh, Coast Guard, as I mentioned, converted versions of the um, Arctic offshore patrol ships for uh, the Navy. Um, it brings the total up to eight. Again, these two were also added under the Trudeau government, um, and this increases the entire Arctic patrol fleet uh, up to eight ships, uh, which is what was originally uh, proposed even uh, 10 years ago. So it's good to see some things actually manage to make it through to the end. Um, and then I mentioned, of course, multi-purpose vessels, uh, the light icebreakers, um, to really bring that harmonized fleet of 16 of, you know, the same class of vessels, so really save on econ economics, you know, spare parts and training, all that good stuff. So yeah, as opposed to the current configuration of the Canadian Coast Guard, which is a bunch of very different vessels sort of combobulated over the last, you know, 20, 30, 40 years and built at different times for different purposes. Uh -huh. And now the Navy. So, you know, Harry the Wolf up there um, in the ice, sailing backwards after it sailed forwards because, you know, it could. Um, doing its uh, ice trials in the Arctic. It's, uh, you know, there are a lot of doubters in the beginning about, you know, these are just slush breakers. And then, of course, everyone's comparing them to say, oh, why don't we just buy the Norwegian ones? Or why don't we just buy the Danish ones? And uh, none of them bothered to actually look at the specs of each of those particular vessels. And, you know, ours are built considerably more, you know, stronger um, than the Norwegians or the Danes because we have to deal with a lot of multi-year ice here in the Canadian Arctic. So, you know, that's a, one of those things. Um, so obviously a primary constabulary vessel, um, but as I think uh, Ryan will talk about in his uh, post-lunch uh, talk, you know, a lot of military role as well with a little bit of uh, underwater sensing um, capability that's his modeler. Um, and of course, mentioned the protector class, the uh, JSS, so-called Joint Support Ship, um, is derived from the Berlin class AOR that the Germans have. Um, nothing too exciting there. Um, it it'll, you know, incorporate a bit of a amphibious capability by having some so self-propelled barges to help bring things onto the beaches, um, but otherwise still a fairly uh, conservative, um, you know, auxiliary oiler replenishment vessel. And right now, of course, we're dealing, we're working with only one, a converted. Um, container ship, so um, definitely a dedicated uh, military grade um, support vessel would be great for actually being able to transit through or in uh, towards combat zones. And of course, finally, the uh, Canadian Service Combatant base uh, is going to replace the Iroquois class DDGs that we had. Uh, we had three of them up until uh, 2014, and we haven't replaced them yet. Probably should have been replaced like 10, 15, 20 years ago. Um, and the Halifax class FFH, you know, are 12 ships, um, or 12 Halifaxes uh, that we have in this country. And they're based on, of course, the British Type 26 model. The baseline model is base haul everything from sort of below the radar mass down. It's pretty much the same as a uh, Type 26 for the Brits. Um, but we're going to add a Spy 7 radar uh, with Aegis um, combat systems. And that will make them, you know, if all 15 ships get built, um, are, uh, that will give Canada the world's second largest Aegis fleet. So that's a um, you know, fairly ambitious goal, you know, when I first saw the stats for uh, what we're aiming for um, in this particular program, um, yeah. And so they're single class service combatants. So, you know, unlike a lot of other navies, which sort of have, you know, batches of three or four or six of a particular type and then switching to something else, where you decide to just go with 15 of the exact same type um, with the same high-end anti-air, anti-submarine capabilities, just because Canada, we, you know, have to provide some context. We are, you know, a country in the same geopolitical situation or, geostrategic geogra geographical situation as the United States with the same sort of global desire to operate. So unfortunately, our fleet split between both, both coasts. So, you know, we only have five ships on one side, 12 ships on the other. Um, and you try to split the fleet up between different classes of ships, not great. So some critical questions is then, you know, is this enough? Are these ships enough? You know, in terms of fleet numbers, you know, I mentioned the two coasts, persistent global presence, um, 15 ships, split them evenly, say, so, you know, eight and seven, um, you know, only three of them are available at any one time, of course. Um, and of course, we're replacing our current fleet on a one-for-one -one basis, but of course, that's a much greater combat capability, right? So CSC, because it has quad packing missile capabilities, you know, it has seven and a half times more um, self-defense missiles than the current Halifax class, if you were to shove them all with the same type of missile, which you're not, but, you know, just to give you a sense of that capability change. Uh, and then, of course, fleet composition submarines, uh, more AORs, uh, amphibious vessels, um, defense policy review that's coming might have something to say about that. 
can we do more? Uh, we have major personnel recruitment and retention problems. We could have more shifts, but we have enough people to do it. Um, not right now, obviously. Um, but we're not finishing the ships now either. You know, it's going to take 20, 30 years to freaking finish all of them. <laughs> um, and uh, the popul but you have to so think about, you know, population growth of Canada between now and the time these ships are built. You know, there's major growth between now and the 2050s, you know, when all the ships are online. So that's sort of the uh, population base have to think about um, when you're thinking about crewing all these vessels. And then, uh, of course, can we do these faster? Because uh, right now, um, you know, the first uh, CSC is kind of expected to enter service-ish in uh, 2030, 2031. Um, and they're expecting, you know, even the head of the uh, CEO of Irving Shipbuilding was saying, you know, it's only when you, we finally get things up to uh, snuff that we can build, um, you know, them at a rate of one and a half, one ship every one and a half years off the line, which means, you know, one and a half years times 15, that is many, many years away. Um, not great, but can't, so, but how do we do it faster, right? You know, do we split the bill between two yards and then it'll cost more because, you know, cost productions, all that kind of stuff, or do we let Irving just really expand their yard and build two ships at a time? Um, there are different options for these kind of things, both extremely costly. Um, bow of Harry the Wolf, or no, well, Harry the Wolf, um, was after Max Bernays, uh, ship four, anyway, of the Arctic offshore patrol vessels, gives you a size of how big they are. Um, but in terms of the general strategic importance of having this domestic shipbuilding capability, you know, Canada is going to provide one quarter of North America's sur advanced surface combatant construction capability. Like, this is not nothing. Um, you know, if war happens elsewhere, we need that capability here. We know the Americans are stretched, we know everybody's shipyards are stretched, so even just a little bit on our side to help contribute to these things uh, is vital um, for allies and partners. Of course, the core challenge is speed versus sustainability. Again, back to the boot and bust thing, we could build these things faster, but then the yards um, will be left with nothing for a while, and unless we decide to give them more work, um, which, you know, more ships are always better, <laughs> and more different ships are always better, but, you know, we're going to need to have some kind of a discussion about, yeah, we can build the CSEs faster, and there's ways around that, they're expensive, but then what comes after uh, to prevent that bus cycle from happening once they're all built. So that's, uh, there it is. Oh, bonus less inflation, because we build the ships faster, because we put all that funding into the same budget. So anyway, that's that, done. Admiral Topshi, ladies and gentlemen, I was honored to be asked to uh, join this panel this morning. I do have to make a disclaimer that my views are my own and don't represent those of the Center for Naval Analysis or any agency of the uh, U.S. government. My topic, ship construction in Northeast Asia, uh, I will address some of the ship construction uh, particulars, but I want to frame it also in the international situation. Uh, this is an area that early in the last century was termed the cockpit of Asia, uh, meaning that what happened in Northeast Asia was going to foretell what happened in Asia generally. In fact, one uh, newspaper writer with the wonderful name of Hector Bywater uh, forecast the war between Japan and the United States early in the last century. He even talked about a surprise attack based upon Japan's surprise attacks in some earlier conflicts. I define Northeast Asia as Japan, Korea, Russia, and China, but have to add the United States and Canada to that mix. And I'll talk briefly about both uh, later on. It's an intensely maritime conflicted area going all the way back to the 13th century in the kamikaze wind. Uh, we had the China-Japan War of 1895, which was, uh, again, intensely maritime, naval. The Russo-Japanese War of 1904-05. Uh, Japan's seizure of German colonies in 1914-15, obviously maritime. And of course, the Japanese-Chinese War, which World War II for China, we have to remember, didn't start in 1941. It started in 1931 and went on for 15 years. In fact, one interesting historical incident was in 1932 when Japanese aircraft carriers launched what I think was probably the first attack on shore targets uh, off of Shanghai. Currently, of course, the, the conflict continues in this area. Uh, in the Sea of Ahosk, we have the Russo-Japanese dispute over the Kurils or the Shishima. Yellow Sea, we have the uh, 
little rock called Yodo or Socotra Rock, which is disputed among China, Japan, and Korea, both Koreas. In the Sea of Japan, we have Dokdo, or Takashima, as the Japanese refer to it, or perhaps we should go back to the original Western name of Leon Court Rocks. And the East China Sea is particularly troublesome. There's not only the seabed disputes between uh, Japan and China, but also the three-way dispute over the Senkakus, or the Daoyus, or the Daoyudais, as uh, China and Taiwan refer to it. And I have to throw in a parenthetical note here that uh, despite all the U.S. talk or talk elsewhere for the need or not the need to support Taiwan, that as far as territorial claims and sovereignty is concerned, Daibei uh, agrees fully with Beijing, which is sometimes not helpful. Uh, but let me turn now to regional navies and ship construction. And I think there's some common factors among all the ship construction going on among the nations of Northeast Asia, uh, with the possible exception of the DPRK. North Korea has been devoting a, a good deal of attention to small submarines and also uh, supposedly to a, a fleet ballistic missile submarine. Some of these common factors are, in fact, submarines by all the players in Northeast Asia, and also uh, an attempt to use unmanned vehicles, as we, as we heard in the last session, SUVs, UAVs, surface ships. That's something the United States has certainly joined in. If we look at the uh, recent pronouncements by the United States Chief of Naval Operations, talking about building a 355 ship fleet, we find that in fact, a good number of those ships are theoretically going to be unmanned vessels. Something in the future, but something that we're also seeing the early uh, examples of today, not just by the United States, of course, but by, by uh, all the participants in Northeast Asia, I think. And finally, there's the uh, emphasis certainly by uh, China, South Korea, Japan, uh, and Russia to use space-based assets. If we go back to Desert Storm in 1990-91, we find that one of the chief lessons that China seized upon uh, as enabling the U.S. military effectiveness and Western military effectiveness was our ability to use space-based assets. And this has become a theme among all the nations of, of Northeast Asia. And of course, if we're going to talk about scientific technological advances, as we've heard today, we also have to talk about artificial intelligence, information technology generally. Uh, again, a common theme among uh, naval construction, maritime construction in Northeast Asia. And let me address some of the nations particularly. Uh, China, of course, has been engaged in a high intensity naval construction, uh, series of naval constructions probably with the same building rates, say for some of their guided missile destroyers as we see in other nations. But the fact is that the booming Chinese economy has allowed the Chinese to devote that much more attention and many more resources uh, to naval ship construction. In, since 2006, China has built eight nuclear powered submarines. And in the last couple of years, they've launched uh, five guided missile destroyers, NATO designation 52 Deltas, which are roughly equivalent to U.S. Arleigh Burke. Now, when you look at a, at a uh, 52 Delta, you see the planar array that is typical of an Aegis ship, but I have certainly not in open source literature seen any discussion of the computer power that lays behind, that, that powers that array, if you will. And that, of course, is the key question. Uh, China, of course, also has uh, now built two aircraft carriers and has a third one underway. Japan is, uh, has, is buying F-35 aircraft from the United States and will base them on one of their DDHs, the Izumo. Uh, they have also uh, are renewing their submarine force and, uh, and have Aegis ships already and will be expanding that fleet. South Korea also, the South Korean Air Force has already purchased F-35s and there's an on-again, off-again program in South Korea I may be out of date here, uh, to, to build an a, a air-capable ship that can house, that can launch the F-35s. South Korea has also built AI air in, uh, independent propulsion submarines and also a version of Aegis that they've acquired from the United States. 
The Russian Navy, since 1990, I would characterize as a lot of plans and a lot of talk, but very little action. Uh, they have built four Bore class fleet ballistic missile submarines, one of which reportedly is operating in the North Pacific. And they have continued to build some other submarines as well. And some light craft corvettes and so forth. I have traced eight announcements by Moscow since 2006 about future aircraft carrier plans. Uh, in fact, President Putin earlier, I think it was late 2021 or early this year, made an announcement about the next uh, Russian aircraft carrier. Uh, unfortunately, there's no shipyard in Russia capable of building an aircraft carrier because they used to get their aircraft carriers built in Ukraine, which would be a bit awkward right now. Um, let me discuss, I mentioned the U.S. proposal to build uh, a fleet of 355 ships. That's been very much a moving target over the last 30 years, certainly the last 25 years. Um, Successive U.S. governments, State Department, National Security Council, the military, the Joint Chiefs of Staff, repeatedly announced that the Indo-Pacific is number one priority and that China is, quote, the pacing threat uh, for building U.S. defenses. And yet when we look at the resource allocation, it seems to still be dominated by concern with Europe and the Middle East. Uh, another factor and a more positive factor, perhaps, in the U.S. attention to the Indo-Pacific is the efforts by the U.S. Army and Marine Corps to uh, expand their role in that theater. Um, recently, the, uh, the U.S. Marine Corps announced their interest in becoming uh, capable in anti-submarine warfare, uh, which probably raises more questions than it answers. Uh, Canada has uh, programs underway, or hopefully underway, for building additional frigates and submarines. Uh, Canada does play a role in, in Northeast Asia as a member of the UN Command in Korea, uh, not to mention in participating in exercises recently in the Japanese Fleet Review and in the biannual RIMPAC exercises uh, headquartered out of Hawaii. Perhaps most significant is Canada's obvious proximity uh, to the polar passages north of us. And I suspect that despite talk we, talk we hear from Washington, including a new doctrine supposedly signed out by the White House, that the United States is gonna to have to rely on Canada as uh, the most uh, uh, likely and powerful uh, Arctic force, should that be necessary. Let me offer five points in conclusion here. Ship construction is expensive, not just in dollars, but in personnel, a skilled labor force. I've had conversations with a couple of folks here in the last two days uh, about welding. This goes back to a study I participated in on the Navy staff in Washington in 1992-93 about expanding the U.S. submarine force. And it turned out that the most critical factor in doing that was getting nuclear qualified welders. Now that is not, the need for expert welding is not limited to nuclear vessels, obviously, but also concerns an icebreaker, for instance. You can't tack weld the sheet metal in an icebreaker hull. It doesn't last very long. Uh, and this is, a, this is a labor problem that I think is suffered by certainly all the nations represented here today. It certainly is in the United States and apparently in Canada, talking to some of my colleagues here uh, yesterday. I'll also note that there are fewer shipyards worldwide. This is due not only to the lack of the specialized labor skills that are required, but the simple cost that has led to consolidation of previously independent shipyards. I think in the United States now, there's only two or three that can really build, uh, I think there's two that can build nuclear powered submarines and two or three that can uh, build warships or are interested in building warships at all. Another factor is the uh, multilateral nature of naval activities in Northeast Asia. The United States, of course, and Canada have firm allies in Japan and South Korea. China has a uh, possible ally in North Korea. I also have to note that the rest of the Chinese allies consist of Laos and Cambodia, so it's a little bit out of balance. Uh, but history counts. I was very encouraged the other day 
to see a joint announcement by President Biden, President Yoon of South Korea, and Prime Minister Kishida of Japan. Because if we can, uh, if Japan and South Korea can overcome the historic baggage between those two countries and operate jointly at sea, it will very significantly affect the, uh, the maritime picture in Northeast Asia, in fact, throughout, throughout East Asia. The maritime environment in Northeast Asia also I'll, I'll describe as both competitive, but also geographically limited. When you look at the map, and you see the constrained bodies of water there, you can appreciate the necessity for cooperation among maritime forces, ideally even when it came to ship construction. It would be very beneficial if the nations of that region and the United States and possibly Canada could organize the ship construction process to avoid duplication and maximize the ability to do, conduct joint operations. I'll also note that for decades now, Japan, South Korea, and China have dominated the merchant shipbuilding sector, as we heard in the last panel. Uh, this is not going to change in the near term. Uh, the ability to build merchant ships, hopefully, or, or usually at least enables the ability to build a warship hull, but obviously, the, the technology has to be applied, uh, and a merchant ship uh, shipyard cannot automatically build war, warships, but at least the basic technology and organization is there. And again, China, Japan, and South Korea have long dominated that area. Now, the, the Northeast Asian ship construction process or um, factors are inherent and native to the region. But what dominates that is the political and international picture. To an extent, the Northeast Asian alliances and uh, hostilities are subsumed in the US-China relationship, but not necessarily dominated by that relationship in all hands. As I mentioned, I'm very encouraged by the recent uh, pronouncement by President Biden, President Yoon, and Prime Minister Kishida. But I go back to my basic point that ship construction, which has shifted dramatically in the last few decades from system building to uh, what's called zone building, uh, enables continued domination, should enable continued dominance of the Northeast Asian maritime picture despite China's uh, enhanced naval facts. And I have to mention two uh, concern, two limiting factors in China's naval uh, progress, since that's my specialty. Uh, number one is command and control. How does a submarine operate effectively if the commanding officer is not independently empowered to make his decisions? If, for instance, he has to call back the radio back to home base to get a decision made about what he should do next in carrying out his mission. I'll also note the importance of personnel, not just as a labor force in constructing uh, warships or merchant ships for that matter, but also as a primary factor in operating a warship at sea. I was very impressed the other day when I, when I took a day sail on a, one of the local uh, Canadian ships to observe the, ob the obvious relaxed atmosphere, but absolute professional competence, not only by the officers, but by all the enlisted men that I, I witnessed operating that ship. I find that very encouraging. I have not seen that aboard the Chinese ships I've visited, and I visited Chinese ship warships between 1994 and 2014. It's a very different sort of Navy, and I think that the personnel performance and the personnel capabilities in the, the uh, other Northeast Asian navies, Japan, South Korea, the United States, and Canada, would in any, in any conflict provide the uh, defining basis for the outcome of that conflict. Thank you very much.
안녕하십니까 저는 대한민국 방위사업청에서 잠수함 획득을 책임지고 있는 전영규 해군 준장입니다. Distinguished guests, greetings to you all. I'm Rear Admiral Lower Hap Zhan Yonggyu, heading the Submarine Acquisition and Defense Acquisition Program Administration, so-called DAPA, in South Korea. 먼저 뜻깊은 컨퍼런스에 초청해 주신 캐나다 해군 및 관계분께 감사의 말씀을 드립니다. First and foremost, I would like to confer my heartfelt appreciation to Royal Canadian Navy and the all the organizers of this conference for inviting me to this meaningful event. 오늘 이 자리를 빌려서 어, 현재 진행되고 있는 대한민국의 잠수함 획득 프로그램에 대해서 소개할 수 있는 기회를 가져서 영광입니다. It is my tremendous honor to deliver my presentation on our ongoing submarines acquisition program at this conference. 예, 저는 잠수함 장교로서 209 및 114급 함장과 잠수함 사령부에서 작전 임무를 수행하였습니다. With my own background of serving as a submariner, I served as the captain for Type 209 and 214 submarines. And I also carried out my mission as a director of operation at RK Submarine Force Command. 약 30년간의 해군 생활을 하면서 다양한 잠수함에 성주할 수 있는 기회를 가졌습니다. Throughout my experience of more than 30 years in Navy, I had many opportunities to onboard various submarines. 오늘 발표 예정인 장보고 3급 잠수함은 정숙성, 신뢰성, 타격 능력 및 성조원의 편의성 등을 고려할 때 가장 우수한 잠수함이라고 생각하고 있습니다. I personally believe that the KSS-3 that I will present here today has the highest level of silence, reliability, strike capability, and also convenience for crew members. 한국 해군은 30여 년 전부터 어, 독일과 기술 협력을 통해서 한국에서 건조한 209급 및 214급 잠수함을 운영하고 있습니다. Rock Navy has operated Type 209 and 214 submarines for last 30 years, which were built through technology cooperation with Germany. 이 잠수함들은 많은 국가에서 운영되는 우수한 잠수함이지만 연안 작전용으로 대항해서 장기간 임무를 수행하거나 지상 표적에 대한 타격 능력 등 한국 해군에서 요구하는 능력에는 다소 부족한 점이 있었습니다. These submarines have an excellent performance evidenced by its operation in many countries. However, the operational concept of Rock Navy requires some more features for long-term offshore mission for shore-to-shore -shore operation. As well as capability of strategic strike to hit core targets on the ground facilities in case the necessity rises. 이러한 배경에 따라 2007년 어, 한국 해군은 장기간의 대항 작전과 전략적 타격 능력이 가능한 잠수함을 국내 기술로 개발하기로 결정하였습니다. So against this backdrop in 2007, Rock Navy decided to develop submarines that is capable for long-term offshore operation and strategic strike operation with our own technology. 방위사업청과 해군이 협력을 하고 대우 조선해양 등 세계 최고 수준의 조선소와 하나 시스템, LIG 넥스원 등 한국의 우수한 방산 업체들이 참여하여 전투 체계 및 소나 체계 추진 체계 등 핵심 체계까지 국산화를 추진하였습니다. With cooperation between DAPA and Rock Navy, the world-class shipbuilder DSME and outstanding Korean defense companies such as HANA System, Allied Next One participated to lead the localization of combat system, sonar system, and propulsion system as well as core systems. 장보고설이 배치원의 성공적인 개발을 통해서 76%의 국산화를 달성하였고 현재 2척의 후속 양산함이 건조가 완료되어 해상에서 시운전을 하고 있습니다. 
The successful development of KSS 3 Batch 1 accomplished the localization rate of 76%, and two follow-up ships are already finished construction and in the sea trials. 배치원 잠수함은 2020년 디젤 잠수함을 기준으로 했을 때 세계에서 가장 길게 수중에서 자망할 수 있는 기록을 달성하였고 2021년에는 SLBM 발사를 성공하는 등그 우수한 성령이 검증되었습니다. The outstripping performance of batch 1 is widely known through its record of longest continuous operation of AIP system in 2020 among diesel powered submarines and success of SLBM launched in 2021. 잠시 관련 영상을 시청하셨습니까? 하시겠습니다. 본 영상은 한글 자막만으로 되어 있기 때문에 양해를 부탁드립니다. Please let us watch the short video. Please understand the subtitle is in Korean only. Obsolences of technology is chronically seen in shipbuilding programs due to its long running timeline. However, using the evolutionary acquisition concept, these obsolences could be prevented in KSS3 program by taking incremental development steps. 현재 개발 중인 배치2 잠수함은 리튬 전지 체계 등 최신 기술을 적용하여 디젤 잠수함 중 가장 크고 가장 조용하며 배치원급 잠수함 대비 수준 작정 능력과 탐지 능력 공격 능력이 증대될 예정입니다. The batch 2 submarines currently under development will be the largest conventional submarines in the world with the lowest level of noise and by applying up to date technologies such as lithium ion battery system its submerged endurance detection and attack capability will far surpass that of batch 1 submarines. 오늘 발표 핵심 부분이라고 할수 있습니다. 장보고 수리 사업의 성공 요인을 네 가지로 말씀드리겠습니다. There are four key factors behind the success of KS3 program, which is the core part of my presentation today. 첫째는 사업 초기에 핵심 기술 및 국산화 장비를 잠수함 설계 및 건조 일정에 맞추어서 체계적으로 개발해 나갔다는 것입니다. First, from the early stage of the program, core technologies and home ground equipment were systematically developed in accordance with the timeline of submarine design and its delivery. 또한 국산화 개발 실패를 대비해서 국외 유사 장비를 조사하는 등 대안을 마련해 두어서 신속한 전환을 준비했었습니다. 
In addition, in order to prepare for possible failure in localization, the alternative purchase line were prepared along with a contingency plan to use similar foreign alternatives to homegrown equipment. 둘째는 함 탑재전의 핵심 탑재 장비에 대해서 육상 시험 시설에서 철저한 검증을 sorry. 죄송합니다. 두 번째 슬라이드가 어디에 도망가고 없다고. 네. Uh, we are missing the slide, so we will proceed with this one. <웃음> 아, 둘째는 함 탑재전의 핵심 탑재 장비에 대해서 육상 시험 시설에서 철장 검증을 거쳤다는 것입니다. Second, before mounting key equipment to submarine, meticulous verification were made on these equipment using land-based based testing site. 함 건조 위에 설계를 변경하거나 탑재 장비를 변경하는 것은 사업 기간이나 비용에 치명적인 영향을 미치는 요소입니다. The modification in design or type of equipment after shipbuilding will have a devastating impact on timeline and total budget of the program. 육상에서 이러한 검증을 거침으로써 함 건조 과정에서의 시행착오를 최소화할 수 있었습니다. Therefore, by having the verification on land-based testing site, trials and errors could be minimized in the whole process of shipbuilding. 셋째는 최신 디지털 트윈 기술을 활용해서 설계, 함운용 시뮬레이션, 함근조 공정의 적절성 등을 검토하였습니다. Sir, the cutting-edge digital twin technology is utilized to identify suitability of design, operational simulation, and shipbuilding process. 기존의 2D 기반의 설계 도면 대신에 영상 자료를 활용하여 설계자와 소유관 간의 효과적인 의사소통과 즉시적인 요구사항의 반영을 이끌어낼 수 있었습니다. Instead of using existing two-dimensional drawing, visual information is utilized to facilitate effective communications between the builders and military force that raise the requirement, which could reflect needs on the ground within right time frame. 네 번째는 잠수함을 단순히 건조하는 것만이 잠수함 개발의 끝은 아닙니다. Fourth, Building the submarine alone is not the end of the submarine development. 잠수함 운용에 필요한 계류 및 정비 시설, 성조문의 훈련 시설도 즉시에 개발돼야 하는데 장보고 수리 사업에서는 체계적인 사업 계획에 따라서 이러한 전력화 지원 요소들이 즉시에 확보되어 운용성을 보장할 수 있었습니다. Development of facilities are required for operation, such as bursting facilities and training facilities. Therefore, these facilities must be developed in right time. In the KS3 program, the systematic delivery plan could secure these supporting factors for capability building, and hence, right operability was acquired as well. 마지막으로 장부우설이 배치원에 2021년 SLBM 발사 영상을 보여드리고 발표를 마무리하고자 합니다. So before I conclude my presentation, please let us watch the short video of launching SLBM from KS3 batch 1 in 2021. Thank you 
It was quite a short time to show the whole picture, but again, I would like to express my sincere gratitude for your keen interest in KSS3 of Korea. 오늘의 발표가 캐나다 해군의 잠수함 획득 사업에 도움이 되고 앞으로 양국 간의 방산 협력에 기여하기를 기원합니다. I truly hope that my presentation provides some insight for acquisition program in the Royal Canadian Navy and wish to see further growing defense cooperation between the two countries and beyond. 다시 한번 참석해 주신 모든 분들께 감사드리고 여러분 모두의 건강과 행복을 기원합니다. Thank you. Once again, I would like to deliver my deepest appreciation for all guests and organizers, and I wish your health and everlasting prosperity. Thank you. Hello. You're up on the screen and, and good to go. Hi. Uh, very good morning to you. Uh, I believe uh, we have the same uh, mornings, but it's just that uh, the skies are outside my window now is uh, pitch black, whereas uh, it is probably all bright over on your side. So uh, I apologize uh, for uh, having to present virtually here in Singapore. And uh, I would like to extend my sincere gratitude to the organizers for having me despite uh, my absence uh, in this conference. So uh, very thank you, very much thank you to all of you. Now, uh, I'm going to show a presentation. Uh, so bear with me. Uh, I know I'm a last speaker, so uh, I'm conscious of the time and I believe everybody will be gunning for the Q&A uh, and the free willing discussion later. So my presentation today is going to touch on submarine acquisitions uh, in the region. And certainly uh, the Admiral has set the bar very high when it comes to the presentation on submarines. Um, and even though that is a focus on the ROK Navy, I'm going to look at mainly a much general picture when it comes to submarine acquisitions in the Indo-Pacific region with a focus on Southeast Asia. Right? Now, I think it is perhaps uh, quite apt to start broadly when it comes to the submarines acquisitions in the Indo-Pacific. In this case, having done some data crunching, uh, it is important to uh, segment the region into three uh, distinct sub-regions. In this case, uh, I actually lumped Northeast Asia together with the Oceania, in Oceania, Australia is the only country that operates submarines. And now, because South Asia would be the two key uh, naval powers, and that will be India and Pakistan, and then Southeast Asia. Now, the trend that we see here is segmented into a 10-year time frame, starting from 1992. I started from you know, the immediate uh, post-Cold War era, and then looking at how the trend of the growth of submarines had progressed over these past uh, many years. And I think it is clear to see a sort of a general rising trend uh, in total. And in fact, it all started to slow down around the past 10 years, in fact. And leading the pack, of course, is Northeast Asia and the Oceania. The numbers here appear to be daunting. Uh, we are looking at you know, almost 200 submarines in Northeast Asia. And the key reason for that is that you know, the submarines contributed to the region were largely from North Korea, which has a very huge submarine fleet, despite the um, state of um, the readiness, as well as the relative age of their fleet, as well as China. However, you will see that in Northeast Asia, from 2012 all the way to this year, the numbers uh, dropped um, slightly. And these were largely contributed from China. Uh, there is, in fact, a sort of a reduction, shrinking of the fleet in the past 10 years. And the older Soviet vintage uh, and Cold War vintage vessels were subsequently being phased out in favor of newer boats. And they don't necessarily come in 
as a one for one replacement. And of course, the North Korean numbers remain largely static, and I will attribute it largely to the fact that you know there is very little data coming out from North Korea, and so the data presented in the existing sources like WWS, CIPRI might not you know speak of the full picture of the actual state of readiness uh, in the fleet itself. And in Northeast Asia, I think there are two key. Uh, powers to consider when it comes to the quantitative increase in the number of submarines and that will be Japan. Uh, the increase of the fleet from 16 uh, some 10 years ago to 22 right now and these number may drop slightly when you know the older boats will be decommissioned progressively and then newer boats enter into service and there's a slight increase in the number of boats in South Asia contributed by India um, and of course the key uh, most significant increase were observed in Southeast Asia and that largely were contributed by say the Vietnamese uh, Navy having commissioned fully its six kilo class submarines as well as Myanmar becoming a new entrant into the game with one former Indian submarine and one former Chinese submarine in total. So this is the trend that we see going forward. In fact, as my, this current slide will show, the trend line is that from 1992 all the way to 2012, there is a sort of an exponential increase in the number of submarines across the Indo-Pacific. And then these increase slowed down in the past 10 years, in fact. And you see the red line, uh, red trend line that is uh, at the bottom of the graph is referring to submarine emergency response assets. And for that, I count motherships when it comes to submarine rescue capabilities. And it is encouraging, in fact, to see from 2012 to this year, across the past 10 years, there has been an increase in the number of these assets. However, these assets are not usually considered to be of priority when it comes to the overall plans for submarine acquisition. And if I could be blunt about it, uh, very often these assets were considered to be the afterthought. Uh, and they are usually uh, assumed to be very resource consuming and they were largely dormant and they will always usually you know, be parked in, in, in the bases awaiting for any emergency which of course uh, should never happen and you know the other alternative would be to have those assets you know contributing to regional submarine rescue exercises so the the type of roles that these assets could play in the navy were considered to be limited beyond say you know responding to civil search and rescue operations and they were not considered as important as submarine. And the increase in these submarine rescue capabilities were contributed mainly in Southeast Asia and South Asia, in fact. Now, the trend line towards a slowdown in the proliferation of submarines in numbers has a lot to do with the fact that in going forward right now into the future, submarines are increasingly expensive on a boat-to-boat -boat basis. And we are looking at here, you know, larger boats entering into service, replacing smaller ones that are largely confined to coastal uh, or littoral environments. And these days, the larger boats allow the navies to have an ocean-going undersea capability. However, these larger boats were largely found in Northeast Asia, whereas in Southeast Asia, the navies tend to gravitate towards smaller coastal submarines that were designed and optimized for littoral environment. And of course, we have enhanced quieting features, uh, and that is quite common across the new boats entering into service. And then, of course, we have better combat systems, whether we are talking about sensors, we are talking about the weapons and the payload. And these days, for you know, a smaller submarine fleet, it comes with so-called add-on capabilities. And these add-on capabilities often feature as part of the service life extension programs or other types of ad hoc retrofits uh, as they go along, largely because 
the submarine fleets are expensive to acquire, to operate, to maintain. So the existing fleet of boats were expected to serve for a longer period of time before the next replacement. So these updates or you know modernization retrofits are necessary in line with the evolving technological and geopolitical trends. So these add-on capabilities such as air independent propulsion for conventional submarines or standoff weapons such as cruise missiles as well as unmanned systems whether you're talking about unmanned underwater systems or you're talking about submarine launch uh, drones uh, that could fly for, for instance. So going forward, this is the trend that we're seeing playing out in the Indo-Pacific, whether you're talking about Northeast Asia, South Asia, or smaller players like Southeast Asia, which will be in fact the main uh, region that I'll be focused on since that is my area of specialization. Now, the question and that is posed by uh, the organizers of MSC 22 is whether there is some form of a security dilemma that is driving the submarine buildup in the region in Southeast Asia, right? And suffice to say, it, it is easy to overlook some other factors when we are largely consumed by the media headlines, you know, that were driven by those key developments in the region, the South China Sea disputes, and you know, other flashpoints around. And these, of course, are important. They do drive um, the threat perceptions, and if anything. You know, there might not be a direct threat perception in the classical sense, but in general, in Southeast Asia, the sense of a growing uncertainty will be what largely drives today's submarine buildup instead of the classic, you know, interstate threat perceptions that will be more common when it, when it comes to um, the environment back in the post Cold War era in the 1990s and the early 2000s when, you know, a number of Southeast Asian countries have unresolved maritime disputes and there were you know, more instances of maritime standoffs and other incidents between them. But today, the environment is vastly different. The buildup is largely driven by a sense of the uncertainty felt in Southeast Asia uh, towards what is happening around the region writ large. So the one thing that we often tend to forget because we talk about security dilemma is for a, an interactive driver such as track perceptions or perceptions in general it doesn't necessarily come in the form of you know threat per se but it could well be driven by the fact that other countries felt that if my neighbors acquire a certain capability if i do not acquire the same then i will be losing out uh, in, in that regard and that doesn't necessarily mean that country A feels that country B is a threat, but more because it feels that it might be potentially losing out in the technological uh, trends in the region as such. So it is competitive, but competitive in a different way. I use Thailand's example here. I, I tracked um, the statements coming out from Thailand, and it was interesting at the height of the debate or internal discussions uh, in Thailand about whether they should acquire submarines. It was interesting to see three different, quite different versions of rationalization when it comes to why it wants to acquire submarines. The Navy chief back then in April 2015 talked about this particular phenomenon that I highlighted earlier, you know, catching up with the Jonas's, right? That my neighbors have those capabilities so we should improve our arsenal to keep in touch with that as well. And of course, the second statement that came three months later uh, by the colleague was that, you know, you, you need to project um, your naval capability. And that has uh, some sort of a prestige element in it. And then, of course, there is uh, the other aspect uh, that I highlighted earlier is the uncertainties that the countries in Southeast Asia felt across the region or around the world writ large. So therefore, acquiring submarines is a form of insurance. So the security dilemma may not necessarily be operative if other countries were aware of the intent of the others. But very often, we are operating in what we call a black box of strategic intention. And what I believe is 
something that helped to mitigate the security dilemma uh, came in a few forms. One is that countries in the region did not necessarily embark on arms acquisition at all costs. And much of it is tempered by the existing economic situation. So that is one. The second is that when country A buys a submarine of sort, this is not immediately followed up by acquisitions of the same type, or even you know, this sort of gap could last for more than 10 years, in fact, before the other country buys a prevailing capability, and that is not necessarily in response to the other countries as such. And of course, the third uh, other factor is that in terms of the type of armaments, the type of systems that were chosen, there seems to be an element where you know, there is threat perception management, meaning that countries were cognizant of how their acquisitions may potentially be perceived by their neighbors, and so therefore they need to be careful when it comes to their choice of those systems and those broader capabilities they put into the submarines. Now, in this respect for Southeast Asia, the issue here has always been that if small submarine fleets were the norm and they are extremely expensive, then how do you best justify that? Very much the, the key enemy to the submarine acquisition isn't you know, the enemy posed by other states, but it is more a domestic audience, especially when we are talking about the post-COVID era and then given the current climate of economic austerity and you know, the potential looming uh, economic recession that may come next year. Uh, obviously, government authorities find it increasingly untenable to you know, fend off you know, any domestic opposition to such key submarine uh, acquisition programs. However, for navies, there are always ways to justify them. You know, talk about strategic deterrence and use strategic deterrence not in the form of purely nuclear deterrence, but Submarines in small navies like those in Southeast Asia are usually uh, termed as capital assets uh, of some sort. And of course, anti-submarine and, and, and anti-surface um, uh, capabilities, expeditionary force projection, which I'll come more to that later, ISR capabilities, and then what is increasingly interesting and that has become you know, somewhat a very commonly used lexicon in Southeast Asia amongst the militaries, and of course, that is obviously not prejudicing the fact that some militaries know what they're talking about and some may not know what they're talking about in terms of operations other than war, um, maritime search and locate operations, and even counter piracy operations, counter terrorism. I mean, all these sort of operations, they appear to be out of the place, but you consider that other navies uh, outside Southeast Asia had deployed submarines for operations other than war. In the case of the Royal Netherlands Navy, having deployed a submarine to support counter piracy operation. And before the sinking of the Argentine submarine San Juan, that was a few years ago, the submarine was actually monitoring uh, foreign fishing fleets of the Antarctica. So it is possible for the submarines to operate in peacetime under such circumstances. However, we go back to the same you know, justification problem. You know, how do you justify small but increasingly expensive fleets? In Southeast Asia, it is in almost impossible to find cost-effective um, formula for that because by nature, the submarine fleets in Southeast Asia are tiny and very often we are talking about, say, two to three boats and only a few are able to master uh, a, a fleet of four to six boats in general. Vietnam so far has been the largest submarine fleet uh, of all. And there are, of course, outstanding requirements. Malaysia might potentially double the fleet to four if funding allows going forward. Indonesia has an outstanding requirement for 12 submarines, whether you're talking about full size or smaller submarines in total. But even smaller submarines could also be expensive and it puts a drain on other resources. For example, surface vessels that are extremely important for day-to-day -day activities like counter smuggling, counter illegal fishing, and so you need more surface vessels and then you have to sort of do a very tough balance between how much money you allocate to surface fleet and how much money you allocate for submarines. The other attraction for submarines 
in Southeast Asia, and which is something that it has, has not actually appeared to be mainstream, is expeditionary force projection. So far, Vietnam is the only country in Southeast Asia whose submarine fleet is equipped with a land attack capability. And there are each there's interest evinced by other countries around uh, on the same capability, but so far we have not yet seen any clear and concerted attempt to try to acquire them. Money is one reason, but I believe the other reason has to do with the sort of consciousness about the potential geopolitical uh, pushback. So this is one of the reasons why I don't believe there is a security dilemma that is unfolding in Southeast Asia. It might be the case in Northeast Asia, it might be the case in say South Asia, but in Southeast Asia, this doesn't appear to be operative given the somewhat judicious choices made by Southeast Asian countries on the systems they acquire. And one thing that drives submarine acquisition uh, in Southeast Asia is also uh, something that is important to highlight is emerging new submarine builders. South Korea plays an important role in driving Indonesia's current submarine uh, acquisition capabilities. As well as China that is of course driving Thailand's uh, acquisition capabilities as, as well. And further a few, we are not just talking about building new boats, but we are also talking about the transfer of older boats to the region in the case of Myanmar, in the case of Bangladesh. And China is leading the pack uh, for that. Now, the issue here is that while we are talking about you know, the usefulness of submarines and you know, how it is being justified, I think the current reality is that the economic situation in Southeast Asia is far from assured. Um, after COVID-19, while Southeast Asian economies were trying to grapple with you know, the reduced revenues over the past two years and try to get back onto economic growth, and then you know, they, they try to also uh, deal with a, an accumulating debt pile uh, for their nations, these therefore mean there is a greater need for the prioritization of their defense programs. So for the case of the Philippines, there has always been you know, over the past more than one decade or so, um, an abiding interest on submarines. However, the, one of the latest uh, announcements that came out from the Defense Department is that procurement of submarines is not yet a priority. And the main reason has to do only with cost. The geopolitical drivers were there. Uh, currently, in the South China Sea, tensions uh, were somewhat simmering. Uh, there was a standoff uh, between the Philippines and China around the Whitsun Reef uh, that was in March last year. And the sort of you know, maritime incidents that we saw uh, erupt from time to time and China continued to pose some sort of a challenge to Philippine maritime interests in the South China Sea. So with that, it would have been logical to believe that the Philippines need submarines like that to increase its deterrence, and this is a, a not a secret at all. However, the issue here is that money has always come in the way. For the Philippines, there is a lot more other priorities that need to be put into order. For example, acquiring of surface vessels that will be important for the patrolling of the EEZ and to show presence. A submarine in this case becomes a luxury uh, in that. However, there could be possibilities of exploring some sort of innovative financing arrangements with potential vendors like France uh, if they want to really push for that to happen. But I will have my argument that you know, it's one thing about acquiring submarines but the maintenance of the submarine capability in the long term could pose a challenge when you are faced with uncertain funding environment over the next few years. So what is happening in the Philippines right now is that while they are waiting for submarines, you don't waste time. You, know, you could start to train uh, your personnel. This is not unique in Southeast Asia. In the case of Thailand, before the decision to acquire submarines from China, the Thai Navy acquired a shore-based trainer from Germany and they started this uh, set of training. So by the time you could put your submarines into service, 
you will have your personnel ready. To me, this is a very prudent choice uh, in that regard. You know, if you are serious in having you know, a working submarine fleet, you start early and you don't waste time. You don't only start training when you acquire submarines. You start training even before that. So I believe the Philippine Navy uh, very well epitomizes the type of approach undertaken by countries around the region that wanted to create an undersea capability but have no money to do so, but at least they are able to create the basic foundations for that capability going forward. And there are also other issues in Southeast Asia that we tend to forget because the headlines often you know, was splashed with you know, this idea of proliferation, but the back-end issues were often standing in the way. In the case of Thailand, it is likely that the existing submarine program will be delayed further, not just because of COVID-19, but because of disagreement over the type of systems, over contractual issues. So this is something that I believe is rather instrumental to understand and to take heat for small navies like Southeast Asia. That you need to plan properly. You need to ensure that while you are building small submarine fleets, you need to make sure that your money uh, really, you know, uh, it makes a difference uh, in, in that regard. You know, and you don't try to waste too much money trying to wrangle with the vendors in terms of you know the engines being installed uh, in, in the boat or you know due to some other contractual issues that were not being thought out effectively or properly before you sign on the dotted line. So I think this is one lesson to be learned not just across the world itself but mainly for smaller navies that are largely uh, constrained by funding in the case of Southeast Asia and if not submarines then perhaps we can think about Southeast Asian countries proliferating other types of anti-submarine capabilities and very often ASW capabilities provide a good step up to an eventual undersea capability. Singapore is a good example in that regard. We started you know you know, acquiring the ASW capabilities and we train against other navies, submarines before eventually acquiring submarines. So this is one approach that could be undertaken to build submarine fleets. And finally, my conclusion here is that while we are talking about submarine capabilities and these hugs back to an earlier presentation I made uh, some years back in MSC uh, when that was before COVID, and when I was in, in, in Victoria itself, I highlighted um, the difference between capability and capacity. It's one thing to talk about capability, but when you talk about capacity, it's not just about the number of books you buy, but it's also about the manpower, meaning the human capital that you invest into. And it's also about the supporting infrastructure for submarine forces. And that infrastructure, requires long-term funding because you talk about maintenance, uh, regular repairs and overhaul to ensure that your submarines could operate for as long as possible in a safe and effective manner. And this is going to be increasingly important going forward because as I highlighted right at the beginning that as the cost of each platform increases, then we will expect navies, especially those in Southeast Asia that are pretty small navies, operate their expensive platforms for as long as possible. So if you're looking at a time span of more than 40 years for a submarine, then you need to pay more attention on maintenance, repairs, and overhaul supporting infrastructure going forward. We don't want to have accidents uh, that, will, that will happen. And I believe this is something that navies across, not just in Southeast Asia, but across the region ought to pay heat when it comes to this particular program itself. So with that, I thank you so much for attention. I look forward to the discussion later. Thank you so much. Hey, so I thought that was a, a really uh, great uh, tour de force from uh, four experts that are clearly much more knowledgeable than most of us are on this. I thought it started off very nicely with Dr. Troy giving a, a great overview of the Canadian shipbuilding uh, program, and I uh, deeply appreciated your comments on beating inflation by speeding things up. <laughs> uh, Dr. Cole followed on with a, an overview of Northeast Asia shipbuilding with uh, what I thought were some pretty significant observations on the difference between quality and quantity, and particularly the value of uh, trained crews 
and the independence that's required to successfully operate submarines. Uh, Admiral Jean then uh, demonstrated the value of a long-term program, uh, incremental uh, changes to produce uh, what is clearly a world-class uh, warship and submarine. And then uh, Dr. Ko brought it home, I thought, with a macro view of the submarine construction in Indo-Pacific, um, built on the idea that quality doesn't always tell the story. <laughs> Uh, and uh, I thought it was really interesting to bring in the, you know, the idea of um, investments in submarine rescue, which is something that is clearly not always top of mind, but if you're going to have a capability, you need to also protect the crew that, uh, that operates it. So with that, um, I'm going to open it up to questions. Um, I am a sailor, so I won't issue an injunction against long rants because I find them amusing, uh, but I would ask you to try to keep them short. <laughs> Uh, thank you for all that. Richard Lane, I'm with National Defense in Ottawa. I have a question about uh, fleet sizes and how much science is there behind how these countries, our country included, go into f deciding how many ships to build. I know vaguely that here in Canada we have a four to one ratio. We should therefore have 16 uh, combatants in order to have two operational on each coast, but it seems to be a little bit perhaps out of control and how many submarines and ships are being built in the region. Um, I think back to the arms, uh, the dreadnought race before World War I, and there was thoughts on both sides of how many they needed in order to achieve an aim in the event of war. But what is, what is the ROK thinking? What is Japan thinking? What is China thinking? How do they actually scientifically decide how many submarines or carriers or capital ships are needed? Is it arbitrary or is there some real thought behind it? Is, it, is this on? Um, well, I'd like to tell only semi-facetiously that no Admiral General ever thinks they have enough going into a war. Uh, the recent, most recent book about the Chinese Navy, for instance, by retired Rear Admiral Michael McDivitt, uh, came up with a 355-ship Chinese Navy figure, uh, and in his conclusion notes that China has, no, has not announced how many ships they're going to build. I know in the United States when John Lehman was the Secretary of the Navy during the Cold War that he famously advocated for a 600 ship Navy. Um, I'll also note that today the United States self-declared commitments around the world are pretty much the same as they were in the mid-1980s at, the heart of, heat of, at the height of the Cold War and yet we have less than half of the number of ships. I don't think there is such a thing as a pr precise uh, tally of how many ships, a, how many combatants a nation has. I know that in the US we do a rough count about our commitments to allies and uh, an everlasting attempt to come up with viable scenarios, one plus two, two plus one, two plus two over the court, none of which are very convincing or seem to last beyond the current budget cycle. So I'm afraid I don't have a really good answer for you. So yeah, I think I'm gonna echo very much uh, what Bud is saying. Um, very hard to have a exact science on this. Um, but of course, as you mentioned, there's the uh, one to four ratio or one to three, depending on you know how lucky you are of your maintenance, like how young the ships are. Um, just to have you know one available, one in maintenance, one in training, and all that jazz. And a lot of that depends on, of course, your ambition as a country or your ambition as a navy. You know, where are you sending these ships? You know, if all you're going to do is keep them around our coasts, you know, maybe just patrolling the North Atlantic sea lanes for you know the rest of their lives. Yeah, you probably don't need as many ships as we would as we in under under the current posture of you know the Canadian Navy basically continuously deploying to overseas uh, to the other side of the world from both ends. So, you know, that's going to have a dramatically higher crew, um, crew and vessel requirements, which then, of course, comes down to do you have the people, right? We know right now that we really don't or we barely do have enough people for our current fleet as this. So that's a major constraint on, you know, what size fleet um, are you wishing to have? So, you know, the you know, in traditional, you know, strategic studies, literature or, or approaches, of course, you have your policy, you have your strategy, you have your operations, and then you have tactics and you build your forces to meet that hierarchy 
above uh, rational priorities, but obviously that's not really the case when it comes to these multi-billion dollar projects where you have so many competing uh, priorities within the country that are not related to national defense. Um, so it's wrong, long roundabout way of giving you a not entirely satisfactory answer um, to the fact that there is no good way to say how many ships do we need um, that also respects the reality of the art of the possible. So, yeah. Uh, Dr. Ko, did you want to add anything to that or? Yes, um, thank you so much, uh, Admiral. Uh, just to uh, echo what my uh, fellow panelists have highlighted, I think the most important is perhaps strategy, right? That strategy ought to determine your maritime interests and thereby how do you fulfill them? And by that extension, you know, how many assets you need. And as part of the strategy, something that is, uh, you know, often uh, you know, ran out of our mind is that different countries when it comes to strategy, um, has also to do with you know their relationship within an alliance. When we talk about an alliance, a formal uh, treaty alliance, like in the case of NATO or in the case of the Japan-US alliance, then the alliance strategy also determines um, what that navy requires uh, as part of the burden sharing. So I think that is one factor to consider. The other factor I believe we should consider as well, we don't have much data for that, and very often we could only rely on fragmentary information coming out in the press is the domestic or internal dynamics uh, within the naval shipbuilding industry. I mean, if you look at the case of China, for instance, right, the, the naval shipbuilding industry is huge, but there were also scandals that plagued the industry. So it makes one wonder whether, you know, it's just simply government policy making that drives the number of ships that are required, or is it because within the industry there is a sort of a push factor on the number of ships that ought to be built, the type of ship in particular, as well as you know how, how many of them ought to be built. So I think this is something to consider. So again, you know, I, like you know, my fellow panelists, we don't I don't have a clear answer to that. I don't claim to know exactly what the countries were thinking about. But I believe we roughly fleshed out some of the key issues to consider when we think about how countries conceive of, you know, how many ships they need in their navy. Thank you so much. I appreciate that all those answers. I was sort of hoping there was going to be a golden rule uh, in there because I have uh, testified before many groups on uh, why we need how many we need and. Um, it's always a difficult explanation, so I thought that all of you danced very nicely around the fact that it's a complex problem. It has a lot to do with uh, competing priorities uh, and, of course, overall strategy. And I see we have another question in the back, and we'll go to that. When we think of countries that are leaders in shipbuilding, Canada is not at the top of this list. Our national shipbuilding program comes at a costly premium while being prone to major delays which increases the material risk of our aging ships, the safety of our personnel, and reduces our strategic capabilities. Our supply ships are a perfect example of how the National Shipbuilding Program has failed to adequately support the replacement of our aging ships before causing harm to our sailors. This, in combination with the fact that the expected reduction in shipbuilding costs over time hasn't materialized, leads to my question. How long should we pursue this avenue of shipbuilding until we recognize that we have a more cost-effective, faster means of accomplishing the same task by leveraging the assistance of our allies who have a more streamlined shipbuilding process? Or at the very least, why haven't we looked at a hybrid model? So I'm not precisely sure who the question's aimed at. <laughs> so I'm buying time because I'm going to put Dr. Choi on the spot here in a second. Um, but uh, with that, over to you. <laughs> so, you know, you're, you make a great point about the uh, JSS, and actually that's one of the counter arguments to this. Yes, let's just, you know, leverage some foreign design and just make it our own and make it real easy and instead of building something from scratch, because of course JSS is essentially, you know, as close as you can get to kind of an off the shelf design, right? It's basically the Berlin class and then you update it to current, um, you know, safety standards and requirements um, and, you know, local supply chains and then making sure you can actually build that here. And quite frankly, even if we had asked the Germans, hey, can you guys build a sec, a third, no, a fourth 
uh, Berlin class uh, just for Canada, fourth and fifth for us, they still run into a lot of problems rebuilding the supply chain because that had ended, you know, quite a number of years ago. And so, you know, when you order all those long lead supply items, you need to do that in like 10 years earlier. Um, and for us it's just say, look around, oh yeah, I think we like that ship. Yeah, can you build one for us? And they're like, well, we stopped doing that, you know, quite a number of years ago and we made the contracts for those engines even before that, then you're not, really it's not really obvious that that would lead to the same you know cost or time savings that one would expect um there's you know there's always a you know the proposal um you know that floated around a number of years ago um as part of the canadian service combatant project you know that uh, a certain european company or uh, european country was going to offer us frigates for half the price right uh, of course, you know, there's a reason they didn't submit it through the proper normal process. They have their own excuses about, you know, it being, you know, sort of due to copyrights uh, concerns. Um, but really, let's be honest, it's probably more because they didn't really want to do the homework of, uh, you know, ensuring that Canada's actual strategic interests and in building our industry that can actually supply and maintain these ships on an independent basis and therefore ensure sovereign control over these ships over the long, you know, multi decades ahead. Um, that was, uh, I think, a, big, a major reason why, you know, they wouldn't go through the regular process. And of course, I mean, for me personally speaking, um, having, you know, building ships in Canada even at a premium, which I think sometimes is overstated, um, it, because, because of the way we calculate the math in terms of how we, um, what the projects cost. Um, and so is that, you know, we, by building at home, we don't end up with having ships that are locked in a foreign shipyard for the next 20 years, right? And then you're tied to that country's foreign domestic policies for those next 20 years just for the ships to be built and then maintain them afterwards. And we know that at least some of the volunteer countries or countries are volunteer to build ships for Canada, you know, some of them are moving in political directions that are not necessarily in the best interest of our country. Um, and so there is that concern as well, right? So the sovereign aspect especially when you're building tools to preserve your national sovereignty, it'll be very good if you don't sacrifice that very sovereignty um, along that path. Um, and you know, back to the, you know, it, it, what is the actual cost premium of building at home? Um, you know, one of those interesting things, at least in terms of historical practice, so, you know, once the contracts have been signed and the actual costs are actually fully known as opposed to estimates, um, is that, of course, the Halifax class frigates. Um, they came in at roughly about the same price as one would expect for a ship of that capability at the time that they were built. And, of course, they're not just built domestically, they're designed domestically as well. Um, and so there are a lot of expectations that, yeah, there is a cost premium to building in Canada, and obviously there's a labor cost advantage to build them in countries um, that have access to very low labor costs. Um, but, you know, apparently uh, it's not always the case that um, uh, that the costs will be extremists. And, you know, back to how we calculate costs, include costs in estimations. Um, you notice that I didn't really include hard numbers in my presentation. It's because it's very hard to compare across country lines. Uh, so, for example, you know, we're building our Type 26 and we have our PBO reports every, um, every year that, you know, adds another 10% to the cost because inflation, yes, inflation will do that to you. Um, but, you know, there is some good news as of yesterday is that the baseline Type 26s uh, that the Brits are building, well, they just signed a contract for the final five ships for their end, and they're coming in at two-thirds uh, at two -thirds the cost of the first three ships. So that economies of scale thing is working, and they're paying the shipyard roughly, was it 1.3 billion Canadian um, for each of those. So it's a much cheaper, a num much cheaper figure than we're seeing here in the estimations in Canada. Um, and so, of course, in when we would see those reports from PBO about, you know, how much are these things expected to cost, you have to remember that these include not just the construction contracts for the shipyard itself to build the vessels, but literally everything that's included to make the thing happen is the cost to Canada. It's not how much a shipbuilder is asking to build these ships. And unfortunately, that latter number is usually what we get from abroad. Um, because they usually have long-standing program offices that are funded in different ways and it's not funded under that specific ship project. So, you know, just, and there. I thought that was a pretty good, did you have something better? No. no. So I, I thought that was a, a really good answer. I would, I would add uh, three things as, as someone who worked in force development for a while. One, I would say that uh, you have to compare apples to apples. Uh, and very common in the debate, and I'm guilty of it myself when I'm not on the stage. Um, you know, we compare uh, what is publicly available things, you know, figures for one thing, 
and we don't know entirely what went into the cost of that. And I would offer that often foreign reported numbers uh, don't do the same life cycle costing that we do. So I would put that as, as one marker. Second, uh, and tying on to a comment made by uh, Dr. Ko, um, a capability is not merely an asset. Uh, and I would think that if we look at the fleet in being that, that the RCN operates today, uh, one of the largest uh, issues that we face is uh, planned and corrective maintenance. And the only way you can get that done is by having a maritime industry. And if you don't build the ships, it's very hard to have a maritime industry. Uh, and the third uh, and final point I'll make on this is I think a unifying comment that has been made uh, over the last day and a half is the shortage of uh, trained personnel across the industry, merchant mariners, shipbuilders, uh, naval operators, uh, and the way you build that, I believe, is by having an ecosystem. And part of that ecosystem is building, part of it is maintaining, part of it is training, and part of it is war fighting. Um, and with that, I'll go on to the next question. Question for Admiral uh, Yoon. Uh, you have explained to us the South Korean uh, strategic submarine program. What is your opinion on the North Korean uh, strategic submarine program? We see many, at least four, submarine launched uh, missiles. And on the other hand, we see very old platforms. And so my question is, uh, how the North Koreans are doing to uh, have uh, submarines at sea which are quite old? Uh, 우리 한국의 입장에서 북한의 위협 중에 가장 크게 생각하는 것이 어, 핵과 미사일과 잠수함 위협이라고 생각합니다. I think from perspective of South Korea, the biggest threat from North Korea is uh, nuke and missile threat and submarine threat. 특히 북한 잠수함은 전 세계에서 가장 많은 어, 잠수함을 보유하고 있는 국가입니다. In particular, the number of submarines possessed by the North Korea is the biggest in the world. Uh, so the numbers, uh, it is amounting to almost 70 units of submarines possessed by North Korea. Uh, 싶지만, 그 가지, Therefore, South Korea also wants to have the bigger number of submarines, uh, which almost get equivalent to that, but it is uh, not possible in reality. Uh, However, they, although they have the great number of submarines uh, by itself, so when it comes to the performance, I think the performance-wise, it is uh, uh, somewhere in the middle. 그래서 한국에서 잠수함 프로그램을 진행할 때 uh, 가장 우선적으로 생각하는 것이 uh, 크루즈 미셀이나 SLBM 등 uh, 전략적 타격 능력을 가장 우선적으로 uh, 고려하였습니다. Therefore, the one, of, uh, one of the biggest priority when it comes to the submarine program in South Korea is that to have the capability for strategic strikes such as the uh, cruise missile and SLBM. Uh, as mentioned, we are pursuing our utmost effort to have a cutting edge technology and capability to have our utmost quality rather than quantitative performance. 가장 대표적인 것이 AIP 시스템과 리튬 전지 체계 그리고 SLBM 능력이라고 생각합니다. Uh, the case in point is that AIP system, lead and battery, and SMPN system. 그리고 한국은 앞으로도 지속적으로 어, AIP 시스템과 리튬 등 
지속적으로 수중에서 오래 머무를 수 있는 기술을 지속적으로 발전시킬 예정입니다. And Korea also continue to develop and uh, the cardiac system and technology such as AIP system and lithium ion in a sustainable manner. Thank you, sir. Thank you. All right. Do we have uh, any final questions? I know we still have about three minutes left. Oh, go ahead. Thanks. Uh, Simon Hughes, former RCM, currently uh, Lockheed Martin, Canada. I want to go back to Commander Lane's question and uh, put a slightly different spin on it and, and see what reaction I get from you. I said, does it not come down to something a bit more simple, uh, which is just money? Governments fund the military. Governments provide policy guidance, strategic guidance in terms of what they expect you to deliver on behalf of the government. The military is nothing but an arm of government foreign policy in many respects. So if I give you $10 as a government and you have all the other documents that tell you the type of capability that you need to deliver and you decide that in order to deliver that capability, each capability cost me $2 and I need four, so that's $8, I have $2 left. And is it, does it just not come down to that it's a math equation? The more money a government gives you based on what they're asking you to do, and somebody made the comment, uh, I believe it was you, sir, you know, generals and admirals will take as much as they can get, and uh, having wore the uniform, there's a, there's a good logic behind that approach. Is it not just as simple as it's dollars and cents, and you try to fit as best as you can to deliver the most capability you can in the manner that you see delivers it the most efficiently within the budget that you get. Is that not, at the end of the day, the driver to the equation? Thanks. I, I would like to thank you for that question, uh, Simon. And uh, <laughs> that's around here a little bit. Bud, do you want to take that one? or no, I'll, I'll, take, I'll take a stab. Um, relating to my own experience in the Pentagon, there's uh, on the Navy staff. And I think this is not unique to the United States, although I welcome differences of opinion. And that is there's a huge number of people on the Navy staff in Washington who try to answer that exact question, uh, both civilian and in uniform. How much do you need? How much is it going to cost? How much do we really need? And as you can imagine, the, the, uh, the verbal fights I've never witnessed an actual physical confrontation. The verbal fights can get very intense. And as you indicate, there, there is no real easy answer because we're dealing with not, with not arithmetic, but with calculus. And we've got the pressures from Congress, from industry, from longtime civilian staff in the Pentagon, and from uniformed staff in the Pentagon. And one of the uh, unquantifiable factors is the folks in PA&E or N81 in the Pentagon will have may maybe been there for 20 or 30 years, and the folks in uniform come and go every two or three years. So it's, as I said, it's not arithmetic, it's calculus. So yes, it does come down to money, but the question is always, how much money do you have? Is there room for more? Is there a requirement for more? Is there easier, more efficient way to spend that money? Um, so just a quick sort of segue. I know, I think we, I saw somebody from the Norwegian Navy here. And uh, of course my dissertation includes Norwegians in it. And uh, one of the things I looked at was the Nansen class frigates that they had. You know, otherwise most people see them, I think from Canada anyway, as a, hey, they manage to get nice ships, uh, you know, seemingly at, with no, real notable um, cost overruns or anything like that. Um, but it turns out back in the uh, sort of the early 90s when the project was being conceived for the new frigates for their Navy, uh, they had a budget of roughly, I think it was like 5 billion um, Norwegian kroners. And um, by the end of everything, that cost in total had went up to I don't know, 17 or 18 billion kroners. Um, and so I'm just saying, you know, this, uh, you know, in Canada, we see that cost increase from the beginning of the project in terms of guests best guess of how much it might cost to final realization, okay, we have this capability, we want this kind of ability, how much does it finally end once you add in inflation and everything, and uh, you see that price increase, and yeah, you know, it, we're, we're not unique in that regard. Um, 
and just you know on that on a particular note on that NASA class in terms of you know you mentioned you know it's give us a set budget and you know you want to set capability how much can we fit into this budget time budget frame well part of that challenge is also you know what bids you receive and um you know the reason the Norwegians have an Aegis frigate was not because they asked for an anti-air warfare uh capability at that at that level no they asked for an ASW ship and then Navantia or Navantia back then the Spanish shipbuilder their bid with Lockheed Martin was you know here we'll give you an ASW ship one of the best in the world and then we'll add in you know ages for free and uh, of course it wasn't free because <laughs> it you know it was a spy one f you know no they've never built that before um you have to scale down version spy one obviously but still you know throwing an ages into a completely different vessel um you know that adds in cost and then they added they needed to figure out oh yeah that didn't include the cost we need for length 16 and uh, new esfm missiles and all sorts of other things so that also had to get thrown into the project pool um you know throughout the construction progress so you know in to go back to your point of you know having a set budget and having set capabilities it's not it's never that simple uh, when you're talking about these you know decade multi-decade projects a lot of things happen in the meantime lots of technology changes you're not gonna you know you know build for us anyway you know ship 10 ship 15 is not gonna have the same tech in it as ship number one um, and of course we're working on a batch procurement process uh, for CSC in that regard as you know um, to help alleviate some of those uh, pressures yeah, no, I appreciate uh, all those answers. Uh, I think we're out of time, are we not? Right, we are. Okay. So, uh, on behalf of the conference, I thank you all very much for your insightful comments, and I wish everyone a lovely lunch.